In these times of uncertainty, it's all the more important that we keep collaborating, informing and inspiring each other, so that we can be smarter and better tomorrow. Welcome to the Pakhuis de Zwijger livecast. Good evening, welcome. My name is Tracy Metz, and I'm the director of the John Adams Institute. And of course, a very special word of welcome to our speakers of this evening, Samantha Power and Karel van Oostrom. We have their books here. And I'd like to mention the fact that Karel van Oostrom's book, which uh, originally appeared in Dutch, has also just appeared in English at Barnes and Noble. Congratulations, Karel. Our mission at the John Adams is to bring the best and the brightest of American thinking to the Netherlands. For the past 33 years, that has meant that our speakers were actually here in person. Those were the days. Like so many other cultural institutions, we have pivoted to online events with guests such as Roger Ross Williams, Esther Saffron Four, Francis Fukuyama in collaboration with the Bali, and Madeleine Albright. All of the videos of those online events uh, can also be watched on our website. Most of those events, like tonight's, have been free of charge. But of course, producing them is not really free. We want to ask you to consider making a donation to support the John Adams in these difficult times. The link is here in the chat and also on our website. This is our last event before the summer season, and we are going out with a bang. Today, indeed, we're welcoming Samantha Power, whom we all know as Obama's ambassador to the UN, and Karl van Oostrom, the permanent representative to the UN for the Netherlands. They have both written books about their work, which have both been published by our partner in this event, the Dutch publishing house, Atlas Contacts. And we'll be having a conversation with them. I will be here receiving and fielding your questions. And now I would like to give the floor to our moderator this evening, Chris Keine. Chris. Thank you, Tracy, and good evening, and thank you very much for joining us on this uh, steaming hot evening. But it's, it's probably better inside than out uh, at the moment. Um, you did make the right choice, as, uh, as Tracy mentions, because I'm also delighted with our guests uh, tonight. Um, and with the topic that we'll be discussing, broadly defined in my own terms, um, the how to strike a balance between idealism and realism, or maybe uh, better said, how to combine the two in the realm of the United Nations. Because as Tracy said, we have two ambassadors to the United Nations with us tonight. Samantha Power, who held the position from August 2013 till the end of uh, President Obama's term in January 2017. And Karl van Oostrom, who is the permanent representative to the UN since 2013 also, but is still uh, in uh, function there. Um, they both wrote book as, uh, books, as uh, Tracy said, about their experience. Samantha Power's book uh, is called The Education of an Idealist. Um, it's her third major uh, piece of writing uh, after A Problem from Hell, which was her Pulitzer awarded study on genocide and chasing the flame on this UN giant, Sergio Vieira de Mello. And as far as I know, The Orange Tie, the book by Karl van Oostrom, is his first book, and where Samantha Power's book is about her whole Via de Gang as an idealist, also outside the UN. Power, um, Karl van Oostrom's book is focusing on the year that the Netherlands was, was part of the uh, member of the Security Council as one of the 10 elected members, and for one month, for one month uh, presiding over the Security Council. So that was, of course, after uh, Ambassador Power's tenure, but they've worked together for many years. So I'm sure we have uh, a lot of common ground to cover tonight. So I would like to welcome you very much, Ambassador Powers, to start with you. I cannot hear you. 
I'm sorry. How is it possible yeah. that and, after and, so many Zooms, I make the same mistake? Um, oh. I just want to say it's a special pleasure to celebrate Carol's book uh, and its publication. Uh, it reads like a novel, Carol. It's like a novel. <laughs> and I just realized that I make the mistake that, that infuriates you because I said powers. And of course, you're called power, and everybody always says powers. Um, Samantha Power, welcome very much. From where are you speaking to us? Uh, from Massachusetts, uh, the, the home of the American Revolution. Okay. <laughs> and is it a relief to uh, uh, not be the ambassador to the United Nations in, in these times? Or are you itching to get back in a position like that? Um, I think nothing about the Trump presidency is a relief. And the Trump presidency coincides, of course, with all of us Obama people not only uh, not serving in the government, but also being excommunicated as any Trump official who has contact with an Obama official inherently draws suspicion uh, from the president. It's a very kind of zero sum Manichaean mm -hmm. worldview. And, um, but when you see, uh, you know, the, the, the U S leading the world in Corona deaths and you see the climate denial and you see so many conflicts around the world where the U S is not really playing any kind of role, never mind a catalytic role, uh, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking for yeah. Americans who are paying the price, and it's heartbreaking for, for people around the world. So yeah. I can say that Carol can't, uh, and, and probably wouldn't, but, but um, so in that sense, I think we're all eager to begin to dig out of the hole uh, that Trump has left the United States, the American people, the, the, the world. Yeah, we'll come to speak about that. Um, Carol van Oostrom, a well, very warm welcome to you, too. Thank you very much. And from where are you speaking to us? I'm speaking from my home, which is very close to the end. But in New York, we're still in a, in a sort of lockdown, which is really in a worse state than we are in Holland. In the Netherlands, we really have already started opening up. Here, um, certainly at the UN, all work now is virtual. And I've been once to the United Nations last week, or two, twice, I should say, to cast a vote in the Security Council election. Uh -huh. It was wonderful to see my colleagues again, but for the rest, um, my life is like Zoom, and I feel like part of the Zoomers generation. And as for your home, is it anything like the suite in the Waldorf Astoria that Ambassador Power describes, uh, where she was doing long distance running with her kids in the corridors? No, it's much smaller, and the ceilings are much lower, so... Um... Okay. I don't think it's exaggerating, uh, uh, Ambassador Power... Uh, hinted at it uh, to say that these are interesting times, especially also for the UN and the relationship the UN has with, uh, with the United States. Does that give you energy or are you longing for something quiet after seven years at this position? Um, well, first, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, that's no for, I, that was for Carol, I yes. If, it, if it's seven years, it must be me, maybe? I don't know. Yeah. Who asked the question, question to yeah, us? Yeah, 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 that's for you, Carol. Most important for us is to pursue our own agenda and to, to try to achieve what we want to achieve. And certainly when we were in the Security Council, we had a number of key priorities, improving peacekeeping operations, accountability and prevention of conflict. And there we built coalitions with our friends in the Council, with our allies in the Council, and we tried to make a difference. And I wrote the book to, to try to show on the one hand to the Dutch people why the Dutch taxpayer pays my salary, and the other, and that's why I translated it in Dutch, to share with my colleagues and certainly with the elected members in the council um, practicalities and how, how the reality of the council is, uh, how personal relations can help you achieve your results as well. Yeah, that's, that's one of the things we will definitely talk about, how, how important personal relations are and how you establish them. Uh, you've bo both been so kind as to send us some, some pictures and uh, some clips uh, about your work in the United Nations. Uh, so I will try to, to uh, have the conversation guided by these pictures and, and okay. clips. And um, please excuse my outfit because it's steaming hot in this studio too. And, and Carol, I felt that I could do this because you broke one rule when uh, uh, the, the Dutch were presiding over the Security Council. You took off your jacket there. <laughs> That's true. There, there are some very funny rules, especially in the confidential consultation room, which Samantha knows very well, that some permanent members felt very strictly that you always had to wear a jacket. It was not allowed to eat a sandwich and not have a coffee. 
And I'm, I thought, well, taking off my jacket is what I do everywhere. So at a certain moment when the Russian colleague had opened up the, the meeting in their presidency when they, uh, everyone had worn a football shirt and he came into the meeting with a football shirt, <laughs> the president was there and with my British and Polish colleague, we took off our jackets. So as of that moment when it was very hot, ha, I could just be in my shirt. Okay, well, that's why I took off my jacket too. It's very hot in here. Um, uh, Samantha, I know that uh, Karel van Oostrom uh, would like to be addressed as, as Karel. Can I take the liberty to go to Samantha? Of course, please. Okay, I will do that. Um, can we have the first picture? That would be number one. When was this taken, Samantha? Do you see it? Um, I think since I left government, but I, uh, I think maybe... Um in New York, by a Dutch photographer, perhaps. Okay. You... I, I recognize my Apple Watch, which <laughs> I only acquired in order to get back into shape after I left the eight years of the Obama administration. So it's post-government, that's all I know. Oh, it's post-government. Because I was, I was wondering, and probably it's, it's as trivial as that the photographer asked you to, to look at an, a horizon, but um, what were you thinking at the time? Were you thinking... Um, where did it go wrong in my life, or how ever was I allowed to do that job? I was probably thinking, who the hell is going to pick up my kids at school? <laughs> Why doesn't Cass do the dishes? No, I'm, I'm post-government, so I'm, I'm in a period there where I'm both... Uh, I, you know, I've, I've thought about this a lot, but as a parent, you know, I, my, my children now are 11 and 8 which Carol probably can't believe because he, he knew them when they were running around uh, the ambassador's residence as tiny children. But uh, when you're a parent, you want the clock to go much slower. You want to freeze your parent, your children's milestones in, in time. You, you don't want it to pass too quickly. But when you live under Trump's presidency, you want the clock to move very, very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> and so probably in my gaze lies the, you know, some contemplation of, these, of this contradiction. Yeah. OK. Uh, I'm, so I'm not going to ask you how, how on earth did you combine raising your kids with being the ambassador to the United Nations, because that's such a, a sexist question. Um, <laughs> It is very clear from, from your book that, that you're a very uh, involved person, that you're very involved with the world. Uh, and and th there's a lot to be said about it, uh, which unfortunately we, we will not be able uh, to do tonight because of time. But um, am I very wrong that, that uh, one, uh, one of the most formative experiences for you um, which made you so engaged with human rights issues, broadly spoken, uh, was, was your time as a journalist in, in Bosnia during uh, the war in Yugoslavia. Yes, and I, I would even, you know, given that we have a, a wonderful Dutch audience, maybe even add a beat to that, which is very specifically the events of July 1995 from 25 years ago in Srebrenica. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I, I was, I'm an Irish immigrant to America. Uh, my mother, uh, there was no divorce in Ireland back in the day. My mother and my father were splitting up. My father was a big drinker. And uh, she moved me and my younger brother to Pittsburgh, grew up there. My way of fitting in in America was sport, sport and more sport. Uh, as Carol knows, he organized football games among the UN ambassadors. and. I think some of the more sexist permanent representatives were a little surprised to see me donning my cleats and my shin guards, but I've always been very sporty and I grew up wanting to be uh, a sportscaster. That was my, my currency in America, my way of getting American friends. I dropped my accent, I memorized statistics and baseball history. And, but in, when I was in college, I had a, uh, an experience where I was working at a TV station taking notes on a baseball game in order to help cut the highlights in the news. And I saw the footage from Tiananmen Square uh, in June of 1989 on the, on the feed, on the sequence feed right next to where I was watching the ball game. And that kind of set me on a path where I, I wanted to, to do something in international affairs. I wouldn't have said human rights per se, 
Uh, but right when I graduated from college, it was after the wall had fallen, in November 89, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, at a time of such amazing promise where Fukuyama was predicting the end of history and the triumph of liberal democracy, a very, very different vibe than college graduates are experiencing right now, in, whether in the Netherlands or here in the United States. And the, the blemish on that or the kind of bizarre sort of seeming anachronism amid all that uh, good news was the war that was raging in southeastern Europe. And it was, you know, people kind of wanted to swat it away initially and it wasn't part of the meme, it wasn't part of where history was supposed to be going. Little did we know then that it was a preview of some of the dynamics that we would see today, a, a quarter century later. But because I've been a sports reporter, uh, and I was very moved by what was happening as people were targeted just because of their ethnicity or their religion, women rounded up in rape camps and so forth. I went over there as a freelancer and was there for two and a half years. And just by being so young, I think in part, uh, but also witnessing the UN in action or not, <laughs> mm. uh, humanitarian aid, which dealt with symptoms, but of course couldn't get at the root causes of the conflict. The, difficulties in U.S.-Russian relations. I mean, in some ways it was, um, you know, a kind of preview of, of many of the dynamics that I would, uh, Carol and I would work on together and, and uh, in parallel in New York, but it was very, very formative. Yeah. And in July 1995, when the Serbs were moving toward the, the, the town of Srebrenica and of course so many civilians were gathered at the Dutch base, I was a rookie reporter trying to get my editor to listen to me and to believe that this was going to be a very, very significant news story and a very severe tragedy. And the response I got from my editor was, well, it sounds like when Srebrenica falls, then we'll have a story. That's when the story will be. And that became a kind of defining moment, I think, for me, where I thought, mm, journalism, you know, you're, you're always at the mercy of the gatekeepers. Mm. Uh, to, to, you know, for, for one massacre to stand out compared to another for, for your average reader, uh, you know, by then in the war, people were, had experienced some compassion fatigue. So I think with that experience, it really moved me to try to pivot from journalism. I would always write, I love writing, it's the way I make sense of things in the world, but uh, but it did, it was a foundational moment of, gosh, maybe, you know, maybe one day I can find myself in a position where I'm reading somebody's reportage from a place like this or a circumstance like this and where I don't feel quite so impotent as I, I felt uh, in, I think it was July 9th, 1995. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So in, the, in that sense, you could say that there is a kind of straight line from Srebrenica to New York to the UN. Absolutely. Yeah. Carol, how, how, is, how is that for you? Uh, you've been uh, uh, on a different post. You've, you've, you've been part of the Dutch uh, uh, Foreign Service since uh, the end of the 80s, if I'm not mistaken, beginning of the 90s. You've been based in, in Beijing. Uh, you've been based in Canada. You've been based in Damascus in Syria. Is there, is there any moment uh, where you thought, now I'm experiencing history and now, I'm, and now I know why I'm doing this? There's a number of issues uh, which connect to this. First, uh, Samantha and I, we worked very closely on promotion of human rights for LGBTI people. We really had a very strong alliance and the Netherlands is co-chair of the core group to promote those rights at the UN and that we really make a difference. And I, I vividly remember when I was in the army in 82, 84, uh, the captain, uh, my boss, uh, he was a very macho type. When he came to my marriage two weeks later, two years later when I married Anna, um, then he confessed the day after that he was gay and that he had to keep that a secret for all of his life. And then a couple of years later he died of AIDS and that is a very strong personal motivation for me to continue fighting for LGBTI rights. Um, so that was one formative experience. Second was when I started in Damascus in 92, I visited Beirut almost every week and then the war had just stopped. And I could not have expected that Syria now, after um, seven, eight years, nine years almost, uh, nine years it is, uh, of war, now looks like Beirut like it did in 92. 
And to see the consequences of war uh, make me realize that we have to do what we can, and that's also what we try to do in the Security Council, to prevent conflict, to make sure that people who are suffering from conflict the most, women, girls, children, uh, we have to do our best to prevent that. And yeah. then the last point on Srebrenica, I think there's a historic responsibility for the Netherlands, and it's one of the, the background elements why we did so much to improve peacekeeping operations, because we know what can go wrong if it goes wrong. So we have to make sure that peacekeepers are up to the task, peacekeeping missions, and that they're uh, fit for purpose, and that there was a lot of our fight in the Security Council about. Yeah. Can we, uh, can we have picture number two? You are somewhere there, Karel. Um, is this is this what you what you pictured as uh, uh, as you were growing up as a kid that you would be doing later? Now, first, maybe I have to explain what we saw in the picture. That's a visit of the Security Council to Afghanistan to President Ghani, uh -huh. uh, where we met with the full uh, session of the Security Council with the Afghan government, and we uh, we did a number of things there. We uh, Made, gave a very clear political signal that we would support political negotiations with the Taliban on the one hand, second, that we would continue to, to fight terrorism, and thirdly, promotion of women's rights in Afghanistan. Uh, my dream as a kid, I wanted to be a football player. And <laughs> I it. So um, uh, my, the story of my life is that Marco van Basten, my hero, who uh, uh, was very close, born to where I was born, he was playing first in the first team of my amateur football team when I was 16 and I, I was in the 13th team. And that's about the level of difference in our competences, in our skills. Okay, so that's that's where it went wrong in your life. Uh, I, I wanted to show uh, that picture because there's, there's a feeling I got from your book, Samantha, uh, and maybe we can see the next picture. Um, yeah, this is, this is you with, uh, with the president, of course. Uh, there's a feeling I got from your book that one of the one of the difficult shifts you had to make, being an idealist, as you, as you mentioned yourself, uh, the education of an idealist, um, was that that when you entered first the Obama government in another position and later the UN, you entered a bureaucracy, which is which is something you didn't know. Is that is that indeed one of the big cultural shocks you had to deal with as an idealist? Um, you know, I wouldn't put it probably that way. Weirdly, the pushing of paper, the, the kinds of the things that people think about bureaucracy from the outside that I would have thought didn't really bother me. Mm -hmm. it, it was almost like moving to America at a young age and learning those baseball statistics, uh, I think, if I, if I can use that analogy, and just trying to figure out what the lingua franca was, having the same objective inside the government uh, that I had had as an activist outside, namely to try to push a human rights and humanitarian agenda, to try to get the president and the various, in my first four years, the various cabinet ministers to take seriously the human consequences of U.S. decision making in the same way they would think through the economic consequences, or the security consequences for the U.S. So in a way, I felt like I was taking my agenda and then I had to go in, I had to learn the rules and how it worked. The one exception I would offer, um, you know, where there really was a culture shock were the gender dynamics within uh -huh. a bureaucracy. I had never worked in a large organization. I'd worked solo as a reporter and as a professor and as an activist. And so suddenly, you know, I'm, I'm making arguments in meetings and they're kind of falling flat, landing like lead balloons in the situation room. And, you know, I'm thinking to myself, is this because I'm a former journalist and activist and I'm just not very good at this yet? Is it because I'm the president's human rights advisor and there's a lot of gravity cutting against human rights policy within the American national security establishment. And so I'm the skunk at the lawn party. And, or is it because I'm female and, and uh, this is a kind of clubby uh, atmosphere that is uh, overwhelmingly male, white and male, I should say. 
And initially I thought it was the, me, <laughs> but as I got to know other women who were part of the same bureaucracy and dealing with so many of the same issues, but who worked on really hardcore security issues like non-proliferation or who were advising the president on, on the transatlantic relationship, they were having just the same issues I was. And so we began to realize that there was a gender dynamic at work. And, and that was, uh, I know it's kind of pathetic that it took working in a large organization to, to be really living yeah. that uh, for, for the first time. I mean, I was aware that, that others had lived it and were living it, but, uh, but it, it taught me some survival uh, techniques that I then tried to carry with me uh, to the UN, not so much for me because at the UN, I was America and the host country and a very powerful country, but, but really for other female ambassadors uh, mm. who comprise the, the membership of the UN or, or female UN employees, because if I thought Washington was was male and, and those unconscious biases or, or some of that dismissiveness was at work, the UN was it was that in, in spades for my female colleagues. Yeah. Mm. I, I, I did show uh, the picture uh, of you and President Obama because another thing that I, and I noticed from your book is that all of a sudden while you were relatively close with, with Barack Obama, all of a sudden it was very hard to reach him and it, it caused the fact that whenever you met him and he wanted to chat about the children, you attacked him with, with uh, important points to discuss and, and you felt that he, he got annoyed by that. That, was, that must have been a strange dynamic to, to, uh, to get used to. That's a great point, actually. I, I probably should have mentioned that in my, in my first response. Yes, the, the shriveling up of access to the president, uh, that was also uh, a bit of a reality check when I got to the White House. I, I worked with uh, Senator Obama since his early days in the U.S. Senate. I've been, um, he pretty much set me up with my husband, Cass. We were friends as well as, um, you know, he was someone, of course, that I invested a lot in, in, in supporting. Uh, I, I've been with him on the campaign. And then suddenly, here he is, Mr. Big, and um, <laughs> he gives his personal email address. Uh, the people around him, and this is true of every president, but you know, the, the gatekeepers are making judgments about who's in and who's out on the basis also of what they want the president to hear. And, and some of what I wanted to say uh, may not have been seen to rise to the level of the president, given that we were dealing with such a severe economic recession and he was juggling an awful lot. Uh, but sometimes if they didn't like what I had to say and the issue was on the table, that might be another, another reason that I might not uh, have made it into the meeting. So that was an adjustment. And I wallowed a little bit as I write in the book. I was a bit self-pitying at the outset. <laughs> my, husband, my husband and I would leave every night and we had this, uh, this two-dimensional axis or graph kind of in our minds that we developed, which was uh, two axes. One was effective and the other was respected. And so we'd sit, because my husband was in charge of regulation for Obama, and so we'd leave every night, walk by the White House, see the amazing uh, facade lit up, and feel the privilege of the experience we were having and working for this extraordinary leader in, in Barack Obama. But I'd say, how was it? And Cass would say, effective, not respected. And I'd say, <laughs> not respected, not effective. <laughs> and, and, uh, and it, it varied, you know, you could, you could uh, get a lucky break one day. But actually, Richard Holbrook, who, who Carol knows, uh, the late great American diplomat, was one of the people who just uh, got very impatient with my, my uh, focus on whether I was meeting with the president. He said, you know, those meetings that you want to be in, there'll be 10 of those before a decision is made. You know, you, you, there are so many issues that you can work on in the U.S. government by bringing like-minded people together, by hustling by driving your list of, of priorities. And if you, if it's not about access, it's about mm. impact. Mm -hmm. And that, we, that, so when I think of the education of an idealist, it's, it's less about, oh, I started so idealistic and then I realized it's also very hard. I didn't have that experience no. of government or of working at the UN, but I did have, have the experience of learning how to get more effective in prosecuting the ideals that I, that I brought into government. Mm -hmm. and, okay. and part of that learning also, of course, comes out of being ineffective. I mean, it's yeah. not as if I was, believe me, only effective. But it's just about learning how to build those coalitions, 
uh, how to learn from your mistakes and yep. just being snappier about the system. Yeah, yeah. we have, I think a we have a question from uh, yeah. from uh, Tom. And his question relates exactly to this, and I think this would be a good moment also to show the video that Samantha sent us. Um, he asked about how, it, how do we manage to deal with the contradictions of, on the one hand, having that power and being so limited in what you could do with it. And he mentioned in this case specifically Syria. Yeah. So I thought this well, might be I'd, a... Well, I'd, I'd, I'd like to uh, do it a little bit different. I'd like to start with uh, the video of Karl, if you, if you don't mind, because we're going to discuss Syria uh, quite extensively, and especially the relationship with, with the Russian ambassador in that respect. So we'll come to that question then, if you don't mind. So could, could we show the, uh, the a clip of uh, Karl von Oostrom, please, the book? Such that we know. Karl, did you did you pick the music? Uh, actually, I did not, but I could have. But uh, <laughs> for me, it's a little bit uh, light. I prefer more punk and new wave. Okay. Um, you you mentioned in the book, and and it's clear from from uh, the clip that the three focus points of the Dutch in uh, their year in the Security Council were. Peace, justice, and, and development. Could you elaborate a little bit on, on, on why this focus? Well, um, as, uh, I, I loved what Samantha was saying on also the bureaucracy. You have to pick your fights. You, you have to, to really make clear priorities. Even the Security Council, the agenda is hor horrific. It's like 76 total agenda items. And uh, if you don't um, uh, play it clever, then you're just eaten up by the agenda. So from the beginning, we said we had to focus on things we think are important. Like I mentioned peacekeeping, um, uh, where we have a historic responsibility. Second, prevention of conflict. And thirdly, I think also very important for the, for the Netherlands, we are a host to the International Criminal Court, to the International Court of Justice. Accountability for us is a key issue. Um, we could not have dreamt in in uh, in '95 after the 11th of July that we should see that we should see Milosevic and Karadzic and Mladic uh, in a prison in The Hague. So accountability for mass atrocities is something which is close to our heart, but it's also key that uh, uh, leaders in the world who are about to commit mass atro atro atrocities know that there may be a moment they will be brought to court. So it has a very strong prevent preventive effect as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we focus on that a lot, and uh, one of the things which connects uh, Samantha and me, about 10 years ago, I remember when I visited you in the White House, and we began working on prevention of mass, atro mass, atro mass atrocities, and the whole genocide prevention agenda, where I think we made a difference. Um, so we have to make clear priorities, uh, fight for what we believe in, and build effective coalition, and that's what diplomacy is about. Okay. Um, well... W now that you mention uh, mass atrocities, um, maybe this is a good moment to, to show the clip that uh, Samantha Power sent us.
regime, Russia and Iran. Your forces and proxies are carrying out these crimes. Your barrel bombs and mortars and airstrikes have allowed the militia in Aleppo to encircle tens of thousands of civilians in your ever-tightening noose. It is your noose. Three member states of the UN contributing to a noose around civilians. It should shame you. Instead, by all appearances, it is emboldening you. You are plotting your next assault. Are you truly incapable of shame? Is there literally nothing that can shame you? Is there no act of barbarism against civilians, no execution of a child that gets under your skin, that just creeps you out a little bit? Is there nothing you will not lie about or justify? So Metta Power, um, this, this was um, at, at the end, I think, uh, more or less of your tenure or towards the end, which, which of course started in 2013. You, were, you just arrived as a UN ambassador with uh, uh, the chemical attacks of the Assad regime on, on the outskirts of Damascus and Ghouta, where 1,400 civilians were killed and, and uh, among them 400 children. Um, what, what did we see here? Was this a buildup of, of uh, seven years of anger? What did we see here? Um, the short answer is yes, <laughs> I think. Um, I think that the Syrian revolution began in 2011. This was, as you, as you noted, late 2016. It's also important to bear in mind that the U.S. election of November 2016 had occurred. I think the reason, by the way, that's not my video. That came from USA Today, it looks like, at least from the, from the Chiron. And the reason that mainstream American publications were interested in, in that exchange at that time, I think, was, uh, I wish it were just mere, merely regard for what was happening to people in Aleppo and Syria, but it was also because of Russian interference in the U.S. election. And so, and it was also because we had just elected a president, uh, nudged along perhaps by some of that interference, but we just elected a president who was incapable of shame, it mm. seemed, and was fond of lying and propagating misinformation. So I think its viral scope uh, stemmed something from the fact that it was a kind of cry from the heart about more than the topic in the Security Council of, of, of that day, of that moment. In terms of me, uh, I think very much it grew out of this larger context. Um, I also should note that I, when I sat in the chair that day to attend that emergency meeting the Security Council because of the shellacking of Aleppo that's occurring, I came from uh, a meeting with President Obama, uh, a National Security Council meeting, so from NSC to a UNSC. And what was so striking, and it was the first time I really had this experience of the difference in working for a president um, after an election has occurred in which another president has been chosen. Now, if, if Hillary Clinton had been chosen, there wouldn't have been that feeling. It would have been, you would have been, it would have been a more seamless transition, but very clear that whatever we did in terms of sanction, in terms of condemnation about what the Syrian government and Russia and Iran were doing to civilians, it was clear to us that Donald Trump would undo all of that as mm -hmm. soon as he came into office. I mean, that was the message that Trump himself had sent. And so I think when you say, was it letting loose? It was, and it was, but it was oh, the fact that it went viral gave me no, I mean, it was no solace. We, we, we were America and yet we, we were confronting the limits of our ability to influence uh, monstrous behavior. Yeah. And, and that, so it was heartbreaking. And so I didn't stay and, and relish the showdown with the Russian ambassador. I, I went back to my office just as sad as I remember being. Yeah, but, and, and um, on your scale of effectiveness, because uh, in, in the book it's very clear that you, you've both stressed the, the importance of personal relations and, and, and you make very clear that you've always tried to 
to keep cordial relations with uh, Vitaly Churkin, who was the, the ambassador to uh, the UN uh, from Russia. Um, while in, in his book, Kyle van Ostrom uh, mentions in, in the end that um, in the end of your tenure, you, you, you hardly spoke to each other. Is that, is that a defeat then? Is that something that you think failed? I mean, not, not, not especially you that failed, but the whole endeavor? The, if the whole endeavor is um, US-Russia ties, they deteriorated massively hmm. while, while Carol and I worked there together. And I, again, no, no fault of ours, uh, but, but, um, but you know, what was happening in Moscow, Putin's own hardening, his invasion of Ukraine, the shoot down of the MH17 and, and the massive loss of life and the, and the failure to own up to that accountability that was the Dutch and others pushed and then what happened in Syria and then the interference in elections, it made it very, very hard uh, to, um, in New York, to patch up a relationship that was being broken by, I think, principally the actions of, of, of President Putin. And, but I tried, uh, mm. uh, and Vitaly Churkin, the Russian ambassador, I mean, we didn't try to patch it up, but we tried to extract as much water from that stone uh, as we could. And I, I think, you know, given uh, where relations were between our two countries, uh, we did actually a surprising amount. We created a joint investigative mechanism uh, to look into Syrian chemical weapons use, which Moscow at the highest levels was very, very suspicious of. We, uh, even though Russia doesn't like seeing human rights officers uh, proliferating in UN peacekeeping missions around the world. I think in part because I worked so hard to, to maintain that relationship, partly maybe because Moscow didn't want that fight at that time, but we did succeed in, in expanding the civilian protection capabilities that Carol was alluding to earlier, beginning that process, hmm. bringing about accountability also for the peacekeepers themselves who were involved in committing human rights abuses or sexual violence. Uh, you know, these kinds of things. Russia has the veto. They can toss that around as often as they want. And so I did view it as my responsibility as someone looking out for U.S. interests and believing that U.S. interests are linked to global stability and to peace and to human rights to do what I could to get Russia uh, to be very, very sparing in the use of its veto. Now, the area that it used its veto again and again and again, including in Carol's time on the council, was with regard to Syria. Even there, I would, you know, Vitaly and I worked on getting Syrian political prisoners out of jail and worked on a humanitarian resolution that got food to the northern part of Syria that had been cut off. It's a pittance. It's a, hmm. it's a somebody would say, a snowflake on the Potomac. It's nothing compared to the carnage and the suffering of the Syrian people. But, um, but if I had just written off that relationship and given up on, uh, on us being able to forge some common ground, I think... I would have been far less effective. Yeah. And Carol, how did how did you do that? How did you maintain relationships with the Russian ambassador after uh, 193 of our countrymen were killed uh, by Russian rocket when MH17 was downed? Now, first of all, by working together with friends like Samantha and other people at the council, were extremely supported um, uh, in July uh, 2014. Uh, and have been ever since. And Resolution 2166, uh, we owe in large, large measure to uh, to Samantha and her team. Um, on the point Samantha just mentioned, uh, for instance, on Syria, um, it's gotten worse. Huh? Uh, the, the the mechanism to investigate chemical weapons was killed off end of 2017 by the Russians with three successive ve successive vetoes. Um, what what we have to do at the end is to, if it, if it doesn't go uh, through the front door, let's try it through the back door. So what we did with a number of like-minded countries like the U.S. and certainly um, uh, European uh, members, we went to the OPCW and there we uh, basically had to redo what Samantha did two years before where we set up a similar mechanism because in the, the organization of the prohibition of chemical weapons, the Russians don't have a veto. So that's also the problem in the council is that if there's an, an issue at hand and on the agenda where one of the permanent members has a, a, a 
geopolitical interest. The veto blocks so much action, and then we, then we have to go elsewhere. Hmm. So we did it with uh, chemical weapons, and we did the same with um, the mass atrocities in Syria, where we established the, the investigative mechanism to at least have all the proof of all the mass atrocities ready, which we then can use in, in um, uh, subsequent legal proceedings, which is being used already in some places. Hmm. And then my personal relationship uh, with Vitaly at the time was extremely complicated because um, uh, in 2015 uh, we tried to set up a tribunal and Samantha helped us a lot and other members of the council as well, but Russia vetoed it. And uh, I had a number of encounters with him where we really had to go head to head because um, um, to be effective in diplomacy does not mean to mince words. Sometimes you have to be very frank, very blunt and just... Uh, fight it out with words and it was not always a pleasure but we had to do it yeah in the meantime we have a lot of questions we from do our indeed. viewers so some Tracy, of them are particularly please. relevant to this point uh samantha asks uh, i'm sorry uh, uh, a person named plerner asks uh, the u.n security council permanent five veto is now an anachronism after 75 years We've just been talking about that. Uh, and there are many calls for reform. So how do we bring that about to keep the body legitimate in the post-COVID-19 era? And the question is to? To Samantha. OK, thank you. Um, I'd be interested in, in Carol's views on this. But um, you know, I think the, the, the path to the kind of reform that would do away with the, the veto is at least at this moment in history uh, likely insurmountable insofar as all five permanent members, that means including the United States, Russia, China, would have to approve either the renunciation of the veto or the bestowal of that veto on other countries um, and the countries that are the leading contenders to become permanent members uh, on the basis of size and geopolitical and geoeconomic influence are countries that are, for example, let's say India, Japan, countries that China would would not uh, be interested in seeing sit on the council, I'm quite sure, uh, or at least giving veto to. Um, the, la the last and only Security Council reform that has occurred uh, happened, I think, in, was it, Carol, uh, 1965, I think, where the, the non-permanent membership uh, was expanded. Um, and something like that, I think, certainly is, uh, is something that could get done. I worry that what Carol talked about earlier, just the, the sheer volume of issues that are coming before the Security Council uh, and the amount of time that ambassadors are spending in that body making statements and frankly making speeches instead of hustling and, and you know, negotiating in, behind closed doors, whether one-on-one -on -one or you know, in smaller groups, I, I, I do worry that the, the expansion in size, which would answer at least a little bit of the concern about it being anachronistic that the, that the questioner mentioned, um, that you get more representativeness in such a scenario, but you might get even less effectiveness. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure that numbers are, certainly there'd be no correlation in my mind between more countries and more effectiveness, yeah. but to look at it, I think what we're you're back to that axis of effectiveness and uh, <laughs> together with your husband. And, you know, yeah, effective and yeah. effective. That's a very good. I yeah. hadn't thought of that before. Exactly. Um, just we the last thing I think and, uh, is simply that I think you are going to see, uh, just as I, I think Carl's really interesting response to the last question illustrated, you are going to see more and more getting done. Uh, on what would appear to be traditional peace and security issues at other UN bodies hmm. or at the OPCW and places like that. Or I think you're going to see in a, in a world, certainly if, if, if Biden is leading the United States, uh, much thicker connections, networks of democracies in much more informal uh, settings. That has to do with a question that uh, uh, Rosa asked. Um, we're celebrating the 75th uh, anniversary, the birthday of the UN Charter tomorrow, but is it conceivable, given the uh, unfriendly climate for the UN in the US, that the UN might actually leave for a friendlier region? 
Is that for me? Yes. <laughs> well, take it if you want. <laughs> take it and run with it. I mean, I, I suppose I can add that now to my list of reasons that we can't afford four more years of Donald Trump. I, I didn't need many more items on that list. But, um, I mean, if you saw the United States continuing to pull funding at critical moments like uh, ending its membership, suspending its membership in the WHO and pulling funds at the height of a global pandemic, it, it's conceivable that the patience of fellow member states uh, would wear out. But the U.S. is still, by and large, even under Trump, by far the largest uh, financial contributor, underwriter of the U.N. You could see it in the other direction, where Trump, who, according to John Bolton's book, um, you know, has come very, very close to to uh, trying to pull the United States out of NATO. Uh, you could see him in a, in a tantrum, uh, doing something along the lines of what he did to the WHO for the, for the UN at large. We, I, I will say that um, Secretary General Guterres and actually Senator Lindsey Graham have done, uh, 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 Lindsey Graham as, a, as a, a kind of channel to the White House, have done a good job uh, you know, maintaining a relationship between President Trump, the, the man, the person, and the Secretary General. There, is a, a, there are personal ties there. The Secretary General has invested in those. I think that might explain why the UN writ large actually hasn't been nearly as frequent a target of Trump's uh, tweet rants uh, as other organizations like NATO. Uh, so I don't see it happening, uh, but, but uh, I suppose my view of that is also colored uh, by my knowledge that Joe Biden is running a very strong campaign and, and that Trump is being held accountable currently, at least in the polls, for his horrific and lethal mishandling of the corona mm -hmm. uh, pandemic. Okay. One, one, of the, one of the key arguments we have been using in our discussions with our American friends is, can it be an American interest that so much space which the US is now leaving behind in certain organizations at the UN is being taken over by China and Russia? It's certainly not the Dutch interest. We want, we, we want the US with help very active in the UN. We need the US to be very active. Um, but to see the competing value systems of countries like Russia and China getting more important within the UN system, ever more um, also officials from those and other countries, it's certainly not a Dutch interest. And deep down, I don't think it's an American interest. And I hope that argument um, uh, strikes home that it, uh, that it will help in that discussion. Well, and no, I don't see the UN leaving New York. Speaking about those those values and and uh, the current uh, uh, position uh, of the United States on the international court, um, justice was was one of uh, uh, your uh, spearheads uh, in uh, the year in the Security Council. Um, two weeks ago, I think uh, Secretary Pompeo announced that uh, members of the international court uh, in The Hague will be sanctioned by America when they start investigating American soldiers, uh, for instance, for what they've been doing in, uh, in Afghanistan. And their families. Um, what, what's the Dutch position on that, uh, Kyle? Let, let's first get back on the, 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 the question. You began with accountability in the Security Council. There we worked very effectively together with uh, uh, most of the members in the Council, and me and all of them, on a number of accountability issues, of which one the most important probably was that we got to sanction uh, human traffickers from Libya, people who were uh, responsible for horrible human rights violations in the north of Libya, who were getting very rich by, by uh, engaging in human trafficking. And we reached uh, very, very strong sanctions against them, travel sanctions and financial sanctions. And to the ICC, this is a discussion we're having with the American administration, and uh, we try to convince them that uh, um, that is not the way ahead on this last issue. Yeah. And how does that uh, discussion go out? We'll, that'll play out in the coming uh, period. Hmm. Okay, let's let's move to uh, a little more joyful topic. Something you you both I think uh, put on the record as as one of the the, the achievements you had uh, during your your tenure in uh, in the UN and also our Dutch year in uh, the Security Council. Maybe we can go to the pictures uh, in number nine. No, number nine, please. Well, this one's nice. This is also <laughs> nice, yeah. That's, yeah, that was the one. There you go. Oh, that was great. Where yeah, are we, Samantha? That was very special. Please, please tell us where we are, Samantha. 
I, I mean, I, I feel I should let Carol, Carol, the Netherlands was the driver of the creation of this really important UN institution called the LGBT core group. And uh, the US was a late breaking member, of course, because under the Bush administration and had not joined, but we, we joined under the Obama administration happily. And it was a venue to, to, to brainstorm for what we could do to promote LGBT rights so that the kind of persecution and violence that occurs uh, against LGBTQ people around the world, that, that those individuals who are experiencing that terror, that they would be able to look to the UN and to the UN instruments and norms and have a tool in their system to say that no matter what national laws say, it's just not right. Here are my rights. And, and that was the work that, that we did as, as partners and just so grateful to the Netherlands and to Carl specifically for, for driving so many initiatives. The, the picture that you showed um, is uh, just after the devastating Orlando Pulse terrorist attack where an ISIS loyalist shot up a gay nightclub. Um, and it was, we had the idea uh, to have a core group meeting in the wake of that vicious attack uh, something immensely positive had happened in, in, the, in the days, just a day or two between the attack and that visit, which is for the first time in the then 70 year history of the UN, the Security Council, notwithstanding Russia's presence, Putin's presence effectively on that council, notwithstanding the fact that uh, African countries on the council at that time uh, had on their books back in Africa, very homophobic laws, we were able to get a consensus statement through the Security Council condemning for the first time in UN history uh, attacks on the basis of sexual orientation. And this was, uh, again, it's, it can seem like just small ball in New York or just a piece of paper, but uh, what we heard from, from gay rights activists around the world and transgender activists, just the extent to which it, it made them feel joined and seen and in the wake of that statement, we decided to gather the LGBT core group and think, what else could we do? Uh, in the wake of this consensus, we in the Obama administration were, there wasn't that much time left on the clock. So we decided to convene the core group unusually at Stonewall Inn. Uh, Stonewall Inn, where most uh, LGBTQ people date the, the, and most other people date the origins of the gay rights movement in New York where finally having been harassed uh, for years and years uh, by New York police, uh, gay people uh, at Stonewall Inn rose up and, and basically pushed back. Uh, and that then unleashed uh, a kind of outing and, a, and an outpouring uh, that uh, was the stirrings of what would become something that would ultimately, you know, many, many years later, you know, result in gay marriage. And then even just last week, finally, the Supreme Court banning uh, discrimination on grounds of sexual orientation or interpreting the Constitution or interpreting statutes such that it was uh, banned. Um, so at that meeting, this is, I'm gonna give Carol more credit here. Uh, so I chaired the meeting, it was completely surreal. Uh, the core group, one of its many wonderful features is that a country from the North or the West, uh, you know, the sort of Europe, US axis uh, can't join the core group unless they join along with a country from the South. And so the membership uh, in this uh, core group is much more diverse than a lot of kind of human rights caucuses at the Security Council. But to have all those Latin American ambassadors and, and you know, the beginnings of Asia's presence in this group, and I gather Nepal has joined quite recently, which is an amazing achievement for this group to again, broaden, broaden the, the community of people who are pushing this agenda but for them to all be ordering their, their pints of beer. And then to, to, you know, it was a solemn day. We were delivering flowers and commemorating the, the senseless uh, killing of, of these people on grounds of their sexual orientation. But it was a forward looking day of what are we gonna do next? And Carol had the idea, it was you, right? Uh, who it, it was, um, got the, yeah. the UN General Assembly coming up, all the heads of state coming to New York why don't we paint the entrance, the crosswalk into UN headquarters in rainbow colors? Uh, why don't we, and so heads of state now, as they enter UN headquarters and gather as they do every year in September, that they will traverse this path to equality. Uh, and so that was one of several ideas that grew out of, I think also that was when we redoubled our conviction that we were gonna pursue 
uh, an independent expert on LGBT rights within the UN system, which had never existed before. So that's someone who's going to measure the treatment of LGBTQ people around the world. And that position still exists uh, in part because Europe and Latin America and, and the Netherlands have, have refused to, to allow uh, those who would wish to be spoilers uh, to succeed. But you know, it's really a, a amid a lot of bleak news when it comes to human rights around the world. This is really one of those areas where I think it is worth looking at the progress, at least normatively, that have that has been made, and even uh, looking at Africa and what the positions of legislatures and courts are very, very slowly shifting, but much more quickly than people would have anticipated even just five years ago. Yeah, okay. certainly. And it also connects to a more general point I'd like to make about sure. the UN. What you see both in Samantha's book and my book is that we often talk about words in New York, but how does it translate to reality on the ground and how can we have impact on the ground? And a good example I, I like to use is that we have had many LGBTI resolutions here in New York. There's been a lot of fighting here to get real good non-discriminatory human rights language on um, on LGBTI issues. And I was so proud uh, one and a half year ago when Indian Supreme Court came out with a ruling of over 500 pages decriminalizing LGBTI uh, um, uh, behavior and quoting extensively from UN resolutions so that UN language here in New York can have direct impact on yep. the ground. Um, okay. And that is what a better world is all about. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, yeah. and and I'm I'm glad we can uh, we can end our conversation on this hopeful note. But we're not going to stop yet because we have a lot of questions from uh, we only our have viewers. four more minutes, okay. so we'll so have to ahead. stay with uh, two questions. We have a lot of people joining us from the University of Leiden. A lot of young students who are interested in a career in international affairs, and several of them have asked us. Uh, what would your advice, both of you, and then very short, please, be to young people who aspire to follow in your footsteps to be, for example, future ambassadors to the UN? Read both our books and become, <laughs> an, intern, and become an intern at our mission at the next possibility that COVID allows us. Great. Uh, we've had a, a wonderful group of interns here uh, every year, and some of them now have become diplomats, so I think that's the best advice. What's yours, Samantha? Um, I think, but just to add to, to why reading Carol's book, and I hope my book as well, would be worthwhile, is it does have these very concrete examples of how you make a difference. And the, the newspapers are filled with examples of how you don't. Uh, and I think it's really, I think young people are not getting enough exposure to success stories in international statecraft, and that's one reason that they're staying away. Okay. My advice Another would be... My advice would be, if, I don't, if you don't mind, uh, Quick know question. something about something. <laughs> know something about That's something. That's always but wise. <laughs> I think young people are spread very thin. They want to be experts, understandably, on climate change, on mass migration, on economic inequality, God knows, on racial injustice. And it's very hard for young people today, given the number of challenges coming at them, to choose but if you go deep on one thing, you're likely to have multiple careers where you work on multiple issues anyway. The going deep will serve you no matter what you're working on later. So just really dig into something uh, in a deep way rather than feeling like you have to fight every war. At Our once. two final questions are both um, one word answer questions. So that should let us finish just in time. Um, both of them are actually for you, Samantha. Um, a one-word answer, who do you want to see nominated as Biden's vice president? One no name. way am I answering that question. <laughs> <laughs> ah, come on. I'm going to have to work with, with, the, with you know, and support from afar, whoever. whoever uh, OK, whoever well, that, comes, that brings us exactly to the last question, which is also a yes or no question. Okay. Samantha Power, Secretary of State in the next administration? Samantha Power dedicated 24 seven to getting Joe Biden elected. Uh, and that is the cause of every Democrat, every believer in human rights, every person who believes in racial justice. It's so not about any of us. Uh, it's about making America, America again. And if I may conclude with one last question, because um, your book is about educating an idealist. So the question would be idealism and realism. Is that a contradiction or is it two sides of the same coin? 
For me, it's very clear no. it's two sides of the same coin. An idealist without realistic perceptions um, um, uh, doesn't, doesn't have impact on the ground. It's having impact on the ground. And realists without ideals will just accept how it is, and that's, that's not good at all. I would like to say one thing, and as I have the floor, um, I quote Samantha in the beginning of my book. Um, it's a beautiful sentence of your book where it says, the people we love are the foundation of all else. I know, Samantha, that Cass, Declan, and Rian are very, are very important. You all know that Anna and Gustav are very important for me. So the advice I also have to, uh, to the young students, make sure that your private life is in order and you find the love of your life as early as possible. <laughs> And Samantha on realism and idealism. If you're not if you're not thrilled about what you see around you, if you don't think things are trending in the direction you want, it means you have a set of standards and aspirations that you're applying the world that you're applying to the world. You you, you like you're not happy with the world as it is. You want to make it better. You're an idealist. You have to be realistic uh, about how to be effective in closing those gaps between your aspirations and the world that you want to seek and the world that we encounter now. So you gotta be savvy, you gotta uh, pick yourself up when you when you fall down, you gotta build coalitions, you gotta find great allies, like, like if you're an American, you gotta find the Netherlands. The Netherlands, hopefully you'll get uh, an America back that's that sees the, the critical importance of alliances uh, with our closest friends and those who share our values. So it's all about how to get there. Um, and, and, you know, I think very much uh, flip side of, this, of, the, of the same coin. You can't be airy fairy and think that just wishing uh, something or having good intentions is going to be enough uh, to, to pave that path. It, it takes so a lot. So closing okay. remarks. Thank you yes. very much, both of you. Uh, I have, yeah. uh, give, give the floor for the closing remarks to Tracy. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much again to both our speakers. Uh, thank you to our audience for joining us this evening. And please feel free to share the video of this talk, which will be on our website uh, very soon. Uh, we hope that, as I mentioned, you will consider giving a donation to the John Adams to help us through these difficult times. And I hope you'll join us on September 24th for our next event, perhaps a live event, and if not, an online event with David Frum of The Atlantic. Thank you so much, and we'll see you soon.